Okay, well, hello everybody and welcome to our final talk of day one for our Pearl Anniversary uh, web conference. And it's my pleasure and honor to introduce a name I'm sure is familiar to many of you, Carol Reed. Now, Carol Reed has over 30 years experience in ELT as a teacher, teacher trainer, academic manager, materials writer, and educational consultant. Carol's main specialization is in pre-primary and primary language teaching and she has published extensively in this area. Carol's award-winning titles include the resource book for teachers, 500 activities for the primary classroom, the primary course book series, Bugs, the children's reader, Is It a Butterfly? And most recently, Tiger Time, a fully digital six-level primary course, also published in American English as American Tiger. Carol was president and vice president of IATEFL, the International Association of Teachers of English as a Foreign Language from 2012 to 2016. And you can find out more about Carol by visiting her website, www.carolreed.com. So, Carol, for the final session of day one, over to you. Okay, thanks very much, Dave, for that lovely introduction. And great to see everyone here. And my session with you in the next um, half hour is about finding the pearl in the rough seas of teaching. I think that very often a lot of us feel we're really buffeted about by experiences we have when we're teaching. And as professionals, we need to develop that skill and ability to find the pearls, to learn from our experience. And of course, we do this by employing um, a uh, reflective reflective practice, okay, and here's an image here of a reflective practice cycle. I've taken this one from Andrew Pollard, as he's um, someone that I very first encountered when I started out as a primary teacher about a, a million years ago. But of course, there are lots of different models, and some you will be familiar with, people like Esther Romani, Donald Freeman, Tom Farrell, Schoen, um, a lot of people have written about reflective practice and reflective practice cycles. And I think the important thing to bear in mind is that the idea of re reflective practice is that it is a dynamic process whereby you as a pr practitioner go through successive cycles of um, planning, doing, evaluating, reviewing what happens in the classroom to become an increasingly more competent and better professional. And so reflective practice is a theoretical process, but it's grounded theory. It's informed, of course, by your own reading and input from experts, but essentially it's theory that is built from your own experience in the classroom. And that's why it's so important in helping us to develop, as professionals, a personal pedagogy of practice, which is most effective for us in the particular context that we work in. But of course, as teachers, we come up against um, real life. And reflective practice, in the way that we were taught to do it on teacher education courses is often difficult, if not impossible, to put into practice in the daily realities of life. You know, we give a lesson, we think, oh, that was, hmm, I wasn't happy with that. But we actually don't go further than that and examine why. Or similarly, we may come out of the classroom thinking, yay, that went really well. But again, we're so busy, we don't have time to think about why. So very often in our daily lives, rather than a reflective cycle, we're in a kind of reflective um, cul-de-sac. And the aim of this session is actually to show and share with you how we can all learn from our personal classroom stories, whether they're successes or whether they're failures, and how this can empower us and give us self-confidence in working towards that personalized pedagogy of practice that I've talked about. So what I'd like to do is to share with you some aha moments or pearls of experience from the years that I've been um, in the classroom and what I, 
what I learnt from them. And the first story is a cautionary tale. And some of you may have felt like a cartoon there. And this tale um, comes from my early days of teaching. And it is a key moment that I'll never forget. And um, some of you may have key moments like that too. I had a class of 40 uh, nine and ten year olds. This has been um, actually quite a long time ago when I first came to Spain. And they were sitting in rows in desks which were actually nailed to the floor, so there was no chance of moving them. And me, recently qualified and, uh, as we say in English, bright eyed and bushy tailed and full of the joys of communicative language teaching. I wanted to do a mingle activity with them, one of those activities like find someone who, that I'm sure you're all familiar with, that involved an information gap and that was going to get the children up, moving about, mingling and asking questions. And I think, as um, coming off my recent training course, I set it up by the book. Uh, we modeled the questions, we practiced them, we demonstrated the activity, and the children were ready to go. And the first few seconds of the activity, everything went fine, and but very quickly, it uh, kind of evolved into chaos. And the more I asked the children to walk nicely around the classroom, the more they rushed about. The more I raised my voice, trying to get them um, to speak in quieter voices, the louder they became. The more agitated I showed I was um, by my body language, uh, the more boisterous the class became. So actually, I will tell you, and this is the absolute truth, I found myself imposing an emergency dictation to settle them all down again. And what was my main worry was to make sure that the teacher next door would not be complaining about this young teacher who had just started and was clearly not able to control the class. So what do you think I learnt from that story? Could we have some ideas in the chat box, please? What do you think I learnt? Any ideas? Would you like to say what you think I learnt? Anybody? Rusty's, anybody typing, what do you think I learnt from that story? Okay, well, I'm going to um, share with you, because there aren't too many ideas coming there. Okay, at the time, I actually needed um, an SOS. It was a, a cry um, for help. And from that SOS, um, I actually learned three maxims, which have stood me in very good stead ever since. The first one, softly, softly. When introducing children to unfamiliar techniques and ways of working that they may not have experienced in other classes, go slowly and gradually at first. Give reasons for doing things that they can re relate to and um, understand. In this particular case, perhaps I could have just got them to mingle in their rows. Perhaps I might not have got them up at all. They could have just turned around to the people behind them and done the activity in groups. Uh, somebody there using, somebody, another presenter, pressing my slide. Anyway, never mind. Um, uh, or the other thing I could have done was to shorten the activity rather than have 10 find someone who thinks, just to have five, for example. So softly, softly an important maxim. The next one I learned, stay serene. That just as a teacher's raised, agitated voice tends to heighten the level of excitement and noise, outward calm, strong, open, relaxed body language, and a quiet voice find reflection in the teacher's behavior too. And link to that, there's only one person in the classroom whose behavior you can change. And that, of course, is you. And very often as teachers, we look to blame other things. The space we have in the classroom, the children themselves, the materials we have to use, the parents, everything. And actually, very often, we forget to look 
at what we can do with our own behavior to make um, things work. And there are many different techniques that we can use, of course, um, to do this. Um, and actually, if you're interested in following this up and looking in more detail on classroom management, I have a whole webinar on that area on my website that you can go and watch if you like. But thinking about how you behave and how you relate to children in the classroom leads me to my second story. And my second story is to do with relationships and relationships which are the heart of the matter. And this story, actually, I find it quite difficult to tell the story. I perhaps I shouldn't have chosen to do it. This was when I had a group of five to six year olds, and I used to teach them. They used to come to class twice a week from half past six to eight in the evening. They were usually hyper. They were usually exhausted, um, often both. And an hour and a half is a very long time for that age group. So what I learned to do was organize the time with input at the start, circle time, games, stories, songs, followed by differentiated activities, craft work, cutting, gluing, coloring, that gave me time to sit with individual children, to work with them, to talk to them individually. It was during this time that one boy who I'd noticed was always um, dropped and picked up by his grandparents. And he sort of snuggled up close to me. And he actually whispered to me, Mi papa está en el cielo. My daddy's in heaven. And I, I was in my teaching mode. And it took, me a, it took me a moment for the penny to drop with what he'd actually said. And of course, my response was a very natural human response, although you know, officially in the UK, you're not allowed, of course, to touch children. But I gave the child a hug and held him close. And from that day on, there was a complicity between me and that child. He knew that I knew, and I knew that he knew that I knew about his very special circumstances. And when I met his grandparents at the end of term, and they told me the story, and they said, how important these English lessons had been to this child. And this is one of the moments that I never have forgotten. Um, what do you think I learned? Any ideas? Do put them in the chat box if you can think of any ideas. Any ideas? A lot of you typing. OK. Yes, wonderful, Catherine. Yes, importance of the teacher, lovely, important to know your students, absolutely. That moment made me realize in all my subsequent classes from then on, and no matter what the age, the importance of finding time for one-to-one -one contact to build personal relationships and trust with individual children. And we all know that rapport is to do with um, trust and mutual responsiveness with others. It means that you respond to learners and give them the experience of being understood. And of course, all of us have our own unique teaching persona and personality, and we do it in different ways. But we do need to find that time um, to be able to build those relationships, maybe before class, after class, during activities, or whatever, that empathy. Um, that is so important. And um, as Earl Stevick has so famously said way back in 1980, this was, um, I'll leave you to read that, that actually what goes on in the classroom um, is more important, those little interactions, than the very bigger things. And thinking about rapport and building rapport with children, um, when I was doing work on emotional intelligence some time ago, I actually decided to do a survey with very young children um, on what makes the teacher special for you. And I used as a template and model 
for this survey, a survey that had been done by Michael Berman with adults. I got the class teacher to class teachers, sorry, to administer this survey, so it wasn't me doing it. Um, and it was administered to 300 children in the Spanish um, public school, uh, public school, state school that I was working in at the time. And actually, what the children came up with, they wanted, these were 300 children between the ages of 6 and 12, they wanted a teacher who is kind, caring, funny, listens to you, makes you work, tells you off if necessary, doesn't get angry or shout. And for older children, they wanted a teacher who explains things well, is patient, treats students equally, hasn't doesn't have any favourites, and doesn't go on and on, which I rather like. Okay. Um, and of course, as well as building individual rapport and actually finding out what children value in a teacher to be able to do that, we also need to think about group rapport. And there are many techniques for developing group rapport. Um, one, for example, is any kind of activity that um, allows children to give personal responses and create similarities um, between people. So this one is a little activity where you can have the children going to one side of the room if they like cats and the other side of the room if they like dogs and then comparing and explaining with a partner and reporting back. So we could have cat, dog, we could have milk, juice, we could have strawberry ice cream, chocolate ice cream. If we were doing it with adults, we might have uh, Italian food or Thai food, wine or beer. And in a teacher education context, when I've also done it, we might have things like teaching six-year-olds or 10-year-olds. And an activity like that where we find things in common with other people, and this can be very bonding. Um, other uh, group rapport activities. For example, we usually only get um, our children to put up their hands if they know the answer. What about getting everyone to put up their hands? You put up your right hand if you know the answer, and your left hand if you, if you don't. And this means actually everyone is participating and thinking about whether they know the answer to the question or not. Similarly, any kind of activities which all of us do, which um, synchronize breathing and movement, acting out songs, for example, or in Van Leer's term, have our children intersubjectively engaged through things like reading a story. And I think, um, just to end this little story about rapport, that Maya Angelou's quote is wonderful. It's probably familiar to many of you, but I think that is actually so true, and making our children feel good about themselves is so important, not just for their self-esteem, but for their learning too. And thinking about that leads me on to the next story, and this is a story about engagement, um, about choice. Uh, you know the famous saying, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't um, make it drink. And so this is to do with engagement. And my story here um, is actually when I was doing a unit of work, a uh, content-based unit, topic-based unit, if you like, not, not a strong version of CLIL, but we were doing a unit of work on bugs. And we had um, classified bugs. We'd learned about um, insects and other different types of bugs. We talked about their legs. We talked about whether they could fly. We talked about whether they were dangerous or harmful. We'd done poems on bugs and so on. And the children seemed to be really interested in the topic, so much so that one boy appeared one day um, with an actual shoebox full of silkworms, which actually Although I loved doing the topic of bugs, I was actually a little bit kind of squeamish about these silkworms, but immediately realized all the children were completely fascinated, completely engrossed. And so I just abandoned my lesson. And as a group, we spent the next hour 
observing the silkworm, counting the silkworm, drawing the silkworm, describing them, building up a co-constructed text. So what do you think I learned from that story? Any ideas? What did I learn from that story, do you think? Absolutely, go with the flow. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. That's what I learned. Be prepared to leave your plan. It's in sand, not in stone. Okay, so actually what I learned was don't flog a dead horse. If they're not engaged, move on. And if they are engaged, go with the flow, as someone has just said, Cheryl just said. Okay, fantastic. And so actually considering... I think we need to consider key factors in engagement. Engagement is crucial. If we don't have engagement, we have nothing because we have switched off children. So we need their curiosity. We need to stimulate their curiosity. And the way that we do, you know, with pictures, with riddles, with questions, with prediction, we need to make sure that whatever we're doing is relevant. So what in it for them factor. Very often we as teachers know why we're doing things, but the children need to have a reason for doing things too. Goals. Are they clear? Are they worthwhile? Are they attainable? Do the children actually relate to them? Challenge. Is the level of challenge appropriate? Are things too easy or too difficult? Are we making sure that feedback is an integral part of the process, not just something that comes at the end of a unit, but it is integral to the teaching and learning process, and it is encouraging and in constructive. We need to make sure that our students have the competence to do what we ask them to do. And so this means that we can't ignore the kind of very staged um, skill building that we need to do um, in order to make sure that they do have the necessary can-do skills and strategies. We also need to, where possible, offer choice. That choice leads to a feeling of agency, that students feel that they have autonomy, they exercise a sense of control, and therefore have a sense of ownership over what they've chosen to do. This can be macro choice or micro choice. And I know that you have, some of you will have been at um, CAST's webinar earlier this morning. So I think you'll be aware of the importance of choice. Enjoyment is crucial. You tend to be um, more engaged when there's an element of humor and fun. And of course, flow, sorry about the missing, um, missing inverted comma there, flow in inverted commas because it comes from Chick Fent Miai's theory. Um, originally developed with sports people in the States, um, but to do with harnessing the emotions in order to complete a task in hand. And the last ingredient there, which I've added, courtesy of John Hattie and his work on visible learning um, for teachers, the importance of passion, of actually communicating to children your passion for language, for learning, um, which becomes infectious. Okay, um, moving on super rapid, rapidly, thinking about choice leads me to the next story, which is to do with um, creativity and thinking out of the box. And this story, um, some time ago, I worked for an organization that produced branded frisbees to give to the children over the summer. And so I borrowed an activity from Robert Fisher's book, Teaching Children to Learn, to get them to think of how many ways can you use um, a Frisbee. And this was based on an activity that I found in his book about how many ways can you think to use a coffee cup. And so here is what um, one child came up with. This was a group of um, six and seven-year-olds. And But my favorite... Uh, one, which some of you actually may have seen in my um, 500 activities book, this little boy came up with this creative idea um, of the frisbee being a swimming pool for ants. 
And I have just the second example here, which is to do with um, writing a poem. This is a poem based on conkers that I collect in the park in autumn. And I get the students to write a question, to write a poem. Don't ask me what's happened to that PowerPoint slide. I won't worry about it. But it's an exploration through questions. And actually, if they answer the questions um, straightforwardly, they develop a poem. And here are two examples of poems developed from that. And the first one, by two boys, 11 and 12 year old boys, they've literally just answered um, the questions. Okay? And so you can read that poem there. And I'll show you another one, which is a bit more um, creative, if you like. OK, um, the last line there is probably a, a, a mistake, a brain broken. But actually, it works beautifully in the poem. So what I learned from that, because I'm running out of time, so I don't really have time to ask you, but actually that all our children come to class with creative potential. Just because they only have a little bit of language doesn't mean that they can't also um, be creative. OK, moving on very rapidly. I'm sorry, I can see it's 3 o'clock, but I think maybe we've got a couple of minutes to go. And this is a story about great expectations and the importance for us as teachers of communicating high expectations, both about um, children's academic performance and about their behavior. Because it really can be um, a self-fulfilling prophecy. And if we think we're working with a group of very slow, not very good, not likely to do very well students, sure enough, that is what will happen. And our students nearly always know more than we give them credit for. They're capable of achieving more than we ask them. And they constantly surprise us with their sensitivity and maturity. And very rapidly, super rapidly, this story about using this wonderful picture book, something else, winner of the UNESCO Prize some years ago. And um, it's a story about uh, inc exclusion, rather, I was going to say inclusion, but exclusion and difference. And my story here is actually in a teacher education context. I was at a conference in a country where they'd recently come out of a war. And the organizers asked for volunteers to actually teach lessons to children, real children, in front of groups of teachers. Well, it was the most terrifying session I've ever done to be with a group of 30 children who I didn't know, I didn't speak their language, and to have some 90 teachers watching me give the lesson. And to start off with, I was so conscious of being observed and all the things I was doing as a teacher. But as the, as the lesson progressed, I forgot about the teachers. The children and their ability to discuss the recent experience of war that they and their country had been through using all the English they had at their disposal, disposal to try and communicate their message to me was one of the most extraordinary things I've ever experienced. And you could have heard a pin drop on the floor. They were so mature. And from that story, I mean, do kind of um, put in your ideas of what you think I've learned. But for speed, I've just got to go on. That I learned not only about the power of stories, which is something I use very, very frequently in my teaching. And I know a lot of you do as well but also how we often underestimate the maturity of children's thinking and how refreshingly open children can often be in discussing topics that are quite difficult and quite um, complex. So in terms of um, expectations, um, I love this quote from, from Winnie the Pooh. OK, and I think this is really true. You know, you're, I'm, I'm not going to read it out. And also, Heim Ginnett, OK, a child psychologist that you will probably have heard of. Um, he lived, he died in 1973, so a long time ago. 
I think in terms of expectations, this, that we treat a child as if he or she, of course, already is what we would like them to become. Okay, so my last story, and I'm sorry I've slightly overrun organizers. If you want me to skip my last story, I will. If we've got time, it's very, very quick. My last story is about respect, diversity, and inclusion. Because these things start in the classroom of the child, in the classroom immediate world. Everyone smiles in the same language, and we need to make sure that all children feel valued and included and learn to value and include each other too. And this little story is a story um, of a child I had who came from Morocco. Let's call him Mohammed. It wasn't his name. Um, and he was, he'd come to Spain. He didn't speak any Spanish. He didn't know any of the children. He was just thrown into this classroom. And actually, poor little boy, his strategy for dealing with it was to ask to go to the toilet as often as possible, because that was his way of getting out of the classroom. And it was really, really difficult to integrate him. And so one day when he didn't come to class, I actually sat down with the children and in their own language um, talked to them about how we can help Mohammed. And as four-year-olds always are, they were absolutely, they were kind of amazing. They were just full of ideas. We can play with him. We can sit with him. We can share our snacks, share our crayons. And one little boy piped up amazingly, we can help Mohammed speak Spanish like you help us speak English. I was gobsmacked. And I said, how's that? And the little boy answered, he said, by showing us pictures and speaking slowly. And what do you think I learned from that story? Um, any, any idea? Well, lots of things, actually. Um, and some of the things, are some children's voices are so important? Absolutely. How did you not cry your eyes out? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it was very, very, very moving. And actually, this it was a huge leap forward with Mohammed. They really did respond, these children. And I think I learned, first of all, that actually young children's experience of learning a foreign language, we all know the academic debate is still on about whether younger is better, and mainly people think it isn't better. But actually, these children's experience of learning a foreign language enabled them to empathize with uh, Mohammed, they understood, they, they realized what it might be like not to speak um, their own language. And the other thing, I think, was the importance of actually giving, um, giving a voice to children and giving them an ethical language, if you like, or sort of surfacing so that they can talk about values too. And of course, um, one of the things I really think, and um, highly believe this, and this is completely borrowing from Vygotsky, is this, that the values we foster in children today will make them the people they are tomorrow. And the most important thing is that none of us can be value neutral, because we convey to children um, values just, just by our very being, the way, the way we treat them, the way we are with them, what, what we ask them to do. And of course, actually, um, I will be talking much more about values education, YLT SIG's um, PCE event in Glasgow, and I'm looking forward to that very much. So we've had these six stories. Um, I don't know if you can remember what they were, six stories. Anyone remember? Well, let, just very quickly, classroom management, relationships, engagement, creativity, expectations, and values um, education. And just to go back to our reflective cycle, the value of making this a deliberate, conscious process. Those stories that I've shared with you today um, were far more meaningful to me than hearing them from experts, so-called, or reading about them in books because they were rooted in my own experience. And 
So I think it's really, really valuable for us to think about these incidents, the, the anecdotes that we have from the classroom and what we can learn from them. And I would also advise you to write them down, maybe invest in a moleskin notebook or something and write down the stories that happen. Because I find when I think back, it's usually the stories that I've either talked about or written about that I remember um, most vividly. So my final me message really is ride the waves of teaching. They may be rough, but find the pearls. And remember that your pearls of experience count and make sure you learn from them. Thank you very much. And if anyone has any questions, please do fire away. Thank you. Lovely. Any any questions at all? Crying your eyes out. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Any questions? I don't think I can see any questions. Fantastic. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so thank you. Thank you so much, Carol. It was a lovely talk. And as you can see from the, the reactions coming through, I think it struck a chord with everybody here. So a great way to close day one. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Thanks very much. And as Carol said um, towards the end there, and as has been mentioned in the comments, Carol's opening our PCE day uh, at IATEFL in Glasgow. Um, so we look forward to seeing you there, Carol. Thank you. I just see a question here. How can we help teachers stop underestimating students? I, I think I think that is a really Im important thing. And I think, I suppose by, I mean, I think a lot of the stories that I've shared with you today are actually about not underestimating students and particularly children. And I think, I mean, obviously having a holistic approach to learning um, so that we see language learning just one as one part of children's development and that we need to um, pay attention to all the other parts as well and also encouraging a little more risk taking because it's actually when you risk take as a teacher that you learn about how much greater the responses of the students can be. For example, if you get your children to write a poem using that question approach that I suggested, you'll probably be amazed with what they come 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 up with. So I think it's to do with holistic approach, risk taking, um, recognizing that just because they don't know much language doesn't mean there's not an awful lot to them from a very young age. Thank you. Yeah, yes, ba uh, balancing the language with the educational side. And kind of, let freedom from fear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we, we all have that. You know, my first story suggested that, you know, the teacher next door wondering what's going on. Okay, well, I think it's a very good question, Matt, and uh, lots of food for thought, so thanks. Absolutely, not just focusing on EFL techniques, quite. Taking a more rounded educational, the wider educational approach and vision. Lovely. Thank you. So yes, thank you again, Carol, for the talk and your responses to the questions at the end. And uh, as I said, it's been a, a great way to wrap up day one, and of course, We'd like to take the opportunity to remind everybody there are two more days uh, to enjoy of our conference. So please come back again tomorrow and Sunday. 
And thank you very much again, Carol, for closing day one for us. And uh, we look forward to seeing you in Glasgow. Great. I'm looking forward to seeing you all as well. Fantastic. Thanks very much and for organizing this brilliant event. It's lovely to be part of it. Thank you. It's fantastic. And yes, thank you to uh, my colleagues on the YLT SIG, especially David, Christina, and Gerhard, who laid all the groundwork. Um, I'm, I'm one of the newer members on the committee, so I've just caught the end of it. So I'm going to stop the recording there to um, end day one. And um, thank you all for your for attending. Mm -hmm.